okay. So uh, first of all, I'm sorry. Uh, I was got a little bit confused at the end about the having a PDF for the first reading. When I looked at the syllabus, I realized it actually Wait, said, I will make the first reading available here. But the here was not a link. <laughs> and then I realized that I must have done this last year and I found the PDF. Oh, can everyone hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, right, so, uh, Sorry. So anyway, that the the word here is now a link, and I and I put that PDF up of the first reading from the Aufbau. Hopefully, in in time for Tuesday, everyone can somehow get access to the book. Um. Okay. Um. Are there any questions about the syllabus or any of that stuff? All right. So I'm going to start talking about this book, which we call the Aufbau. Um, um, because of its German title. Um, and I guess it wasn't actually translated into English until, this is something we're gonna run into with Popper too. Uh, when was the translation made? Like 1960, 1963, yeah. So this book wasn't translated into English until 1963, even though it was first published in 1928. So uh, everyone who was reading it was reading it in German, and of course that's why they started using the German title for it. Um, so I have a kind of interesting personal experience with this book, I think, which is, um, so first of all, I think when I started philosophy grad school way back when, um, the, um, kind of received view about the Aufbau was that it contains a pretty simple or like simple minded project basically. Um, and it's a project that failed. So as far as that goes, as I pointed out, Carnap later himself is going to say that it doesn't work in certain ways, but moreover, it was supposed to be thought, it was thought that, um, Quine especially had shown why this project was hopeless all along, right? Like if Carnap had thought carefully, he would have realized that it's impossible that, that, uh, um, what he was trying to do didn't make sense. Um, or it didn't make sense anyway, like I said, that it was hopeless. Um, and then furthermore, what people kind of thought about the rest of the history of logical positivism, Carnap's later works and all these other people was that it was kind of a confused attempt to react to the failure of the Aufbau project. Um, right, confused because none of these people ever this is how the story goes, noticed what Quine pointed out, you know, and they thought that it could somehow uh, still be fixed. So, um, although at the same time, a lot of people at least kind of thought that this project of the Aufbau, or that the, anyway, logical positivism in general had somehow made traditional philosophy uh, relevant or at least that it, it had served to define the terms in which we have to try to extract anything from traditional philosophy. So that's, it's a kind of weird like double um, uh, not entirely consistent set of attitudes I think. Um, 
and most of this probably actually comes from Quine, and we'll read uh, one of the most important places where Quine says this. So anyway, it, pretty much everyone thought that this book was interesting only as a kind of stupid mistake. And at the time, the Alpha was out of print in German and in English. Um, but it just so happened that one of my professors in my first year of grad school assigned a little bit of it. You know, he handed out, in those days, that meant he handed out Xerox copies to us. <laughs> um, and we read a little bit of it. And I was like, hmm, this is kind of interesting. And I went to the library and I got it. Um, and, uh, ended up reading the whole thing. And, but especially when I read the preface, which was not part of what he asked us to read, but, uh, is the first part of today's reading. Um, I said to myself, wow, this does not sound stupid. <laughs> it doesn't sound simple minded something really interesting is going on here. And um, I know that uh, other people around the same time actually were had similar experiences. So that since then, and I guess it's scary for me to realize this, but as I was updating my notes, I realized that this was like 30 years ago. <laughs> In any case, since then, uh, um, there has definitely been a change in how people regard Carnap and how people regard this book. Um, I think a lot more people who worry about this issue at all now, at least, um, think as I do that Carnap is a pretty important philosopher um, and that the Aufbau is a pretty important work, although a strange work, <laughs> as we'll see. Um, now, I mean... Um, that doesn't mean that those people and I necessarily agree about what is interesting about Carnap or about the Aufbau or about what it means. Um, so, you know, I'm going to be teaching pretty much what I think Carnap means. Um, but as I said, also we read Quine, we'll get to see more or less where that other... Um, attitude towards Carnap that was the one I first encouraged uh, encountered where that originally came from. Okay, so um, that's just by way, like I said, of introduction of my personal relationship to this book. Um, there are kind of three separate issues I feel like I have to talk about in order to um, explain what's going on in this book. And the first one is just kind of uh, What's up with this? Like, what's up with this book? Like, why the hell is he talking about all this stuff? What is he, what is really important to him? And why is he doing this? Um, um, you know, that's the thing where when I first read the preface all those years ago, I started to get some kind of inkling that there was an interesting answer to that question. A second question that we have to talk about given what course this is, is what does it have to do with science? Now, it definitely has something to do with science, as um, you will have realized if you read the preface, right? He, he, he talks a lot about the relationship between he's doing and science, but um, and moreover, science keeps coming up in different ways. But uh, it's not exactly clear what the relationship between what he's doing and science is. 
And the third thing is the technical details. Um, so this book is, you know, has a lot of technical details. The most technical parts of it, I, you know, haven't assigned the parts that uh, contain these long, long symbolic logic uh, passages and whatever. Um, but uh, as I said last time, it's um, um, some of these details have to be understood just to in order to talk about these other two things because Carnap himself clearly thinks um, that these technical details are, are really important. So it's not possible to, uh, to understand what he's trying to do without to some extent exploring the, the um, technical apparatus he's trying to use to do it. So, um, so this time, and in a way even more so next time, I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about number three. Um, this time on a sort of conceptual level, but uh, next time I think Um, on Tuesday, I kind of thought that that would be this lecture, but I realized it makes sense that it would be the next lecture that, you know, that I'll actually um, get more into the symbolic logic and mathematics of what he's doing to the extent that I think is necessary um, to avoid confusion uh, or to head off one kind of confusion in favor of another kind of confusion. Um, but so in any case, I'll be talking a lot about like, you know, the, the detailed structure of the project in the book, but with an eye to, to these two things also, and then later I'll come back and talk to them about them more. Um, in I guess the other two lectures about the alpha. Um, but uh, you should notice, I guess, already, um, before I start talking about any of that, in the preface, um, so this is on page Roman numeral 16. It occurred to me uh, recently that I don't know if everyone gets trained to read Roman numerals these days or not. But um, anyway, for these purposes, it shouldn't be that much of a problem. It's just, this is page Roman numeral 16. And uh, Right where he talks about the 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 scientific orientation or attitude, those are both translations of the same German word Haltung, which I'm going to have more to say about later. Um, the scientific orientation or attitude um, that um, that this book belongs in a circle of people who have this kind of scientific attitude. Um, and he says, you know, part of it is that, that we've turned away from traditional philosophy, but then he says the more positive features are more important. It is not easy to describe them. So, right, that's saying, it's not easy to describe them as saying that, that one and two are not easy to understand and not easy for Carnap to describe, right? But it is not easy to describe them, but I shall try to give a loose characterization. The new type of philosophy has arisen in close contact with the work of the special sciences, especially mathematics and physics. Special sciences means as opposed to metaphysics. 
That's what special sciences uh, traditionally means. Consequently, they have taken the strict and responsible orientation, again that's Haltung, of the scientific investigator as their guideline for philosophical work, while the attitude of the traditional philosopher is more like that of a poet. So, um, right, so in terms of the two approaches I was mentioning last time to the, to the question of how philosophy should react to modern science. Um, in that passage, he's definitely taking, I guess it was the first one that I listed, philosophy should become like science. That's what we've done in the Vienna Circle, and, um, and that's the, this book is an attempt to work that out. Um, we'll see, however, later on that the what's left for philosophy approach is, is also present here. Um, but in any case, that's, that's just to say that uh, this book, as you can tell from that passage, is part of a philosophical reaction to science um, of the kind I was discussing in the introductory lecture. Um, Okay, um, are there are there questions about that that stuff? Yes, I see someone has their hand up. I'm just kind of wondering why it took so long for there to be this sort of reaction to science. I don't think it took so long. Like I said, I think it's happened over and over since you know I think it's already happening in Descartes. Um, I could read you a passage from the. Um, from the preface to Kant's Critique of Pure Reason that says almost the same thing that Carnap says here. Uh, I mean, I guess a different question is, uh, like, why does it keep happening over and over again? <laughs> um, and I guess, I mean, the, I guess the simple answer to that is no matter what people try, philosophy never becomes very much like modern science. Um, so, uh, I mean, people can identify something that they think is essential to modern science, um, try to figure out how to make philosophy like that, um, and then they do it to some extent, but it, it turns out that, modern, that philosophy is still not very much like modern science, and so that's why the problem comes up again. I mean... I think uh, there's probably a lot more to be said about that, but I, is, I, I hope that's helpful anyway. Ryan, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, I did. Um, Carnap talks about how like philosophy should be done with like very slow work and not like a single individual kind of constructing the entire system. But I understood like the, the off bow based on the preface as like not the preface, but other parts of it as being constructing this like really complicated system just by kind of himself, you know, this really broad ontological system. So <laughs> yeah. I, I understand, how would he um, see himself uh, with regards to that? Well, I mean, so that's also something that people said before too, right? Like Leibniz, you know, on the one hand talks about how from now on philo philosophy is going to make uh, progress and build, everyone's going to build on their predecessors, but then he seems to set up a system that, that answers everything. <laughs> um, I, I think it's actually, I mean, the issue is less acute in the case of, of the Aufbau. The Aufbau is, um, as, as he says, is only a sketch or an example of how you might do a system like this. Um, and uh, I mean, most parts of it are very exceedingly hand wavy. <laughs> he just says, and somehow we'll reduce this to that or we'll construct this in terms of that, um, which I mean, he's well aware of that. So, um, so uh, you know, 
assuming that the project of the Aufbau is one that it's reasonable to try to complete in the way Carnap is laying out, there's an immense amount of work left to be done. Um, um, so, yeah, so I don't think there's really inconsistency there. However, um, really the inconsistency or I don't know if inconsistency is the right word, but, but really the, the, the problem here happens the, in the other direction because like uh, we'll see Neurot saying this also around this same time, the logical positivists believe that now that they're on the secure path of a science, again, that's Kant's phrase, that, um, that philosophy will be like science in many ways, but one way is that everyone will do their little part and it will all add up. Um, and we'll, you know, and that all we, you know, that uh, Carnap and Neurat both say around this time, there's just a few like confusions to clear up and then we can get started on the positive project. Um, but in fact, the history of logical positivism is, um, that they keep coming back to to um, the beginning again, and right, they they spent the whole time arguing about these fundamental issues. They never really went on to this project uh, that everyone was going to contribute a little piece to, and it was going to grow in that way. Um, So that, I mean, so that's an example of what I said keeps happening in the history of modern philosophy. Um, I think, uh, I mean, there's something similar going on in contemporary philosophy, uh, partly in the aftermath of logical positivism, but partly has its own sources, I guess. Um, Again, like I said, now philosophy is very hyper-specialized. Everyone thinks that the important thing is to be up on the latest literature in your fields, <laughs> um, your field or fields. Uh, but your fields are like two different fields, and you work on the intersection of them. <laughs> so, um, uh, and yet uh, that that literature hasn't. Although it resembles science in that way that people are only talking to fellow specialists and um, um, and mostly concentrating on reading recent stuff. Uh, it doesn't resemble science in that it actually gets beyond the beginning stages and starts to build up a whole. Uh, edifice so to speak on, on the contrary again it just people just keep arguing finding new positions about the most fundamental issues um, so that was that, i guess that was a longer answer than your question maybe asked for but is that i hope that's helpful um okay those are both good General questions. Are there more general questions before? Because now I'm, I'm going to start in on, on talking about some of the details here. Uh, my research goal. So, uh, oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. You see, see how you um, mentioned that, for example, in how I think modern science, you start off and you learn from, you start off, you learn from specific, I don't know, you have like certain basics and then you build up from there, that's how it's taught to students of science. So he, so um, Carnap's attempting to say that this is how philosophy should also be taught, or like how different subjects. Yeah. Like, well, I mean, he's not talking, um, I mean, Yes, it's true that he thinks that this has implications for, for philosophy education, yes. Uh, but um, but um, unlike Kuhn, you know, we'll see at the end of the course, Kuhn's thesis is that 
science is the way it is because scientific education is like that. <laughs> but uh, but Kuhn himself, when he when he says things like that, he he, he starts by saying, "We're going to have to learn to see things as." causes that we used to see as effects, right? So, I mean, I think what, what Carnap is thinking is that because philosophy will be like science, philosophical education will also be like scientific education. And scientific education is the way it is because um, um, all this progress having been made, there's no point in going back and trying to interpret Newton. We just, you know, tell you the contributions that Newton made a long time ago to the progress of physics. You get those from a modern textbook, and then we go on to tell you, you know, and at the end of your education, uh, you don't read any more books, you just read the latest papers, right? So, yeah, so Carnap is, is thinking that Phyllis, I, um, is thinking and, you know, through his influence made that more the case than it used to be, <laughs> that philosophical education would be like scientific education, but still didn't really succeed, right? I mean, uh, oops, oh no, is this happening again? Can you hear me? Yes, okay, I'll just keep talking until it recovers. <laughs> um, so, um, sorry, what was I saying? Um, right, well, it's still the case uh, that, I mean, look at our requirements in this department. Everyone has to take a history sequence. Um, and in the history sequence, we don't read a textbook of, uh, you know, Cartesian metaphysics, we read Descartes. <laughs> so philosophy is still, philosophical education is still pretty different from scientific education. And uh, um, I think, again, that's a sign that this, uh, this project didn't really succeed. Looks like yeah. All right. Um, I mean, this is a good thing to think about, you know. Uh, And, and in, in a way, that's what, like, right, the, the, the moral I'm trying to get to in this course is, is something about how philosophy sees its relationship to science or how it saw its relationship to science in a certain key period. But that, of course, is as a, in the way we use the history of philosophy in philosophy, <laughs> that's a way of thinking about how philosophy is related to science now. So that's what we've been talking about. Let me let me stop talking about that and go back to talking about the Aufbau. Um, so what is the Aufbau about? Well, it's about um, what Carnap calls construction theory. Now, actually, he actually doesn't call it construction theory. He actually calls it constitution theory. Right, that is the German word is Konstitution. Um, the decision to translate Konstitution as construction instead of constitution, um, I think, was made with Carnap's assent, maybe even at his advice. Um, but <clears throat> one of the things it does is um, really obscure the connections or help obscure the connections between Carnap and Husserl. So, um, right, Edmund Husserl, you know, was a very important uh, German philosopher of the very late 19th and early 20th century. Was, you know, everyone knows who was very influential on what continental philosophy, as I was talking about last time, right? Like Heidegger was one of his main students. Um, uh, 
Levinas and Sartre and Derrida all related to things in Husserl. Um, but, uh, but the truth is Carnap also um, read Husserl, um, met Husserl, was in his seminar for two years in Freiburg. Um, so, uh, um, and this term constitution comes right out of Husserl into Carnap. So, like, if this course were going to be about Carnap looking back, then that would be a big problem, and I would have to keep reminding you what the word really is in the original and so forth. Fortunately, since we're going forward, it's not such a big problem, but I just want to point that out. Okay, so from now on, I'm going to call it construction theory, even though it really should be called constitution theory. All right, so what is construction theory? Um... So construction theory is about the um, construction of let me put this in. We have a new concept that we want to introduce. Um, and we have some old concepts sitting around. And the question is how we can use the old concepts to introduce the new concept in such a way that it will um, be obviously meaningful if the old concepts were meaningful. So that in this direction is what Carnap calls construction or really constitution. Or you can look at the problem the other way. Um, I want to know how to um, trace the meaning of statements containing the new concepts back to the old concepts. Um, and that's what concept Carnap calls reduction. Rickfluring, also a Husserlian term. All right, so, um, but uh, Carnap has a particular way of thinking about how this is going to work. Um, he thinks of it as um, something like defining the new concepts in terms of the old concepts. Right? It's not obvious that that's the way to do this, or that that's the only way to do this. Um, but, uh, but Carnap's thesis is that that's the right way to do this. So construction means that we'll be able, and you know, so think of the, the concepts as words, or symbols, or terms. So like, let's say the old concepts um, were the concept natural number, the ones I discussed last time, and successor. And suppose I want to introduce a new concept, um, call it Q, that's going to mean rational number. And then I want to introduce certain relations between rational numbers. Right, so um, rational numbers, so the, the, the underlying idea is that rational numbers, by the way, do people know what rational numbers are? I should say. Right? A rational, a natural number, again, is one of these numbers, or perhaps starting with zero. Actually, let me, let me just talk about the positive rational numbers. Let me start with one, not zero. Right? So these are the natural numbers. The positive rational numbers are all the numbers that can be written 
as a ratio of two natural numbers. So one half, two thirds, three quarters, uh, eight sixths, like whatever. Um, and the underlying thought is that somehow the natural numbers are basic and the rational numbers, those concepts are kind of somehow built up on the basis of the concept of a natural number and of and our concepts of relations are, or that is the relations between natural numbers. Um, but Carnap's way of understanding that is to say that I guess it's actually it's easier to understand the reduction direction first I think. We're going to give rules for translating every sentence that contains this or um, let's say uh, greater than four rational numbers. The greater than relation between natural numbers, we're going to give a way of taking every sentence like that and translating it into another sentence which uh, only uses these natural numbers. Professor, concepts. someone has a question. Oh, yes. Okay. Sorry. Yes. Oh, um, you might have, you might be getting to this in the future, but my question is basically like he makes a distinction between logical complexes and just like normal holes yes. that are made of parts. And I was wondering how that relates to relations like our logical complexes, they obviously must include relations because he says they're like statements about the uh, parts and how they relate to each other, I think. But yeah, I, so, so first of all, I do think that's going to be better to talk about later, probably next lecture is when I talk about that more. But, you okay, know, okay. But, but yeah, I mean, an ex so the easy example of a logical what he's calling a logical complex is a set. Um, so like all the bricks in a given wall make up the whole that is the wall, but there's also a set of all the bricks in this wall. How can you tell that the set is not the same as the whole? Well, like all the atoms in the wall also make up the same whole. Right, that is the the whole composed of all the bricks is the wall, and the whole composed of all the atoms is the wall. But the set of bricks and the set of atoms are not the same set. Um, uh, they have no members in common, right? Because no no brick is an atom, <laughs> or vice versa. Um, and they have a completely different number of members. Right? There's like maybe a hundred bricks and there's like a bazillion gazillion atoms. So one of those sets is much bigger than the other one. Right? So um, um, that's why a logical complex is not at all the same thing as a whole. At least it's not a whole composed of its members. If it is a whole, it must be a whole composed of something else, not its members. Um, Relations then are going to, or, or what Carnap calls relation extensions, are going to be uh, another example of a logical complex. Okay, I, like I said, I'll try, try to say more about that probably next time. Um, Thanks, that answers my question. <laughs> all right. Um, See, I feel like I got into too much detail too quickly here. It's so hard to know how to introduce this stuff correctly. I keep trying to do it a di slightly different way because I know people get all confused about it. But, but you know, maybe I shouldn't have introduced this example about the numbers, like, you know, because that is confusing. But the point is that reduction is going to mean that, so, like, I'm going to have 
propositions that, in, that include the new concepts. Right? Like, so if one of the new concepts was rose, then one of the propositions might be all roses are red. Now, suppose we started with a bunch of words that we knew meant something. That is, concepts that are good. Concepts that... Um, What does it mean that it's good? It means that um, we understand what it is for that concept to apply to something or not to apply. So we know how to use it to make true or false statements. So we started with a bunch of concepts like that, and now we're introducing this new one, Rose, and the question is like, okay, how do we know that that concept is meaningful? And we can be sure it's meaningful if we have a rule that allows us to translate all sentences like this into ones that only mention the old concepts. So we can eliminate that word rose from all the sentences it occurs in. And we're left with only sentences that use our old concepts. Um, and that's the reduction of rose to the old concepts. And it serves that purpose of showing that rose is meaningful if the old concepts were. Or in another direction, you can say we have a bunch of old concepts and we, we realize that we need a concept rose. How do we realize that? I'll talk about that more in a second. But somehow we realize we need to introduce a new concept. And so we want to make sure that our new concept will be meaningful. So we have special techniques for introducing a new concept that will guarantee that we can always do this. We could always go back to the old concepts if we need to. So these are the, these are the relationships between concepts that the constructional system is made up out of. And the constructional system as a whole, then, is it's going to have lots of levels, but it's going to start with some fundamental concepts. And relations, right? So remember, I said that or that relations are, are sort of a, a kind of concept. In fact, you could actually think of relations as just like concepts, only the objects they apply to are ordered pairs, which is more the way people think of them these days, actually. But, you know, um, but anyway, relations are, are, so like sometimes people use the word concept to include concepts with one argument place and relations that have more than one argument place. Sometimes they'll make that distinction. Okay, so anyway, we start with some fundamental concepts and relations, and then by the process of construction, we get some, some new concepts and relations, and then we do it again, and then we do it again, and then we do it again. And in the end, we're supposed to have included everywhere in here, somewhere in here, every concept that we need for the purposes of empirical science. That's the project. And as Ryan said, it's obviously a very ambitious project, <laughs> especially given that Carnap defines empirical science very, very broadly. Right, it includes history and art criticism and anything that involves saying meaningful things about the world that are either true or false. <laughs> this is going to find its place in here. So, um, um, but the important thing to realize, and I started talking about this last time, and now I'm going to emphasize it again, all of this is about concepts and relations. 
It's not about propositions. Now, when I say it's not about propositions, I mean concepts and relations are for the purpose of propositions. Right? Because we can't use them to say or think anything except by, like, you know, if the concept is rows x, then we can't use it to say anything that's true or false except by filling in something for x. This is a rose. This isn't a rose. Or in more complicated ways, you know, like for all x, if x is a rose, there's a different symbols here. If x is a rose, then x is red. Right? That is, all roses are red. So we can use concepts to say something only by putting them into a proposition. Um, but the point of the construction, constructional system is not to show which propositions we should assert. Um, in the empirical sciences, the questions of which proposition, question of which propositions we should assert is an empirical question. Um, but even in mathematics, it's where perhaps it's not an empirical question. Um, it's still different from the question, what concept should we use to form those propositions? So the constructional system is, is trying to answer that question. It's trying to answer what, what concepts should we use and what concepts, because we can't put them in here, should we not use to form propositions. And the thing that's being transmitted, so to speak, from the fundamental concepts to the higher level concepts is not truth, but meaningfulness, right? So the reduction or the construction, one way or the other, it amounts to, it's kind of like a proof, a demonstration of the higher level concept, but not a demonstration that it's true because that doesn't make sense, right? Rose is neither true nor false. Again, to use it to say something true or false, I have to fill in something for the argument and say, this is a rose. Then, I could be true. then it could be true or false. But rose by itself is neither true nor false. So what I'm proving about it by, by finding rose somewhere in this system is not that any particular proposition is true, but rather that this concept rose is meaningful because it can be reduced to these fundamental concepts. And of course, you have to add, we know the fundamental concepts are meaningful, right? Um, so, um, and this is why Carnap says that an axiomatized system has two parts. One is the part he's working on here, the constructional system, and the other is what he calls the deductive system. This is on page seven, section two. Um, A theory is axiomatized when all statements of the theory are arranged in the form of a deductive system whose basis is formed by the axioms and when all concepts of the theory are arranged in the form of a constructional system whose basis is founded by the is formed by the fundamental concepts so um, there's two parts but it's not like um, one is more 
one leads to the other or more, one is more basic than the other or something like that. There are two things you need to do if you want to have a system where um, you can decide whether every proposition is true or false in terms of some axioms. So one thing is you have to be able to prove consequences of the axioms. That's the deductive system. So the deductive system is going to, you know, start with start with axioms and then from the axioms we'll prove certain theorems and then from those theorems we'll prove more theorems and so on and so forth. And eventually every theorem will find its place in that structure. You might hope that every true statement would find its proposition would find its place in that structure, but actually good will show that that's impossible. But, um, but at least every theorem of the system will find its place in that structure. And a little, so there, may be, there will be some true propositions that are not theorems. If the axioms are true and you do the deduction correctly, all the theorems will be true propositions. Right, so on this side, what we're transmitting is truth. We're transmitting truth from the axioms to the theorems. Um, but, and Carnap is saying this is what people usually focus on when they think about an axiomatized theorem. Um, but he's pointing out that that's only half the problem because um, if, like, I give you natural number and successor relation as fundamental concepts and relations, and then ask you to prove that two-thirds is greater than one-half, no matter how much deduction here you do, you're never going to get two-thirds is greater than one-half because um, you don't have the concepts for it. Right? Your axioms only mention the natural numbers and the successor relation. So all their consequences are also going to mention only the natural numbers and the successor relation, unless they're inconsistent. <laughs> but then you're in worse trouble, right? So all their consequences are only going to mention the natural numbers and the successor relation. And so you're never going to get a proposition like two-thirds is greater than one-half. So Carnap says that's why in the axiomatized theory you also need this side. So what you do, someone says, okay, prove that two-thirds is greater than one-half. Maybe that's not the right theory. Prove that two-thirds is greater than one-half. And I'm going to call this greater than Q because it's a relation between rational numbers, not a relation between natural numbers. So, um, what do you do? Well, you use the constructional system to eliminate these symbols in terms of symbols that can be defined using the fundamental concepts. In this case, the rule is going to tell you to cross multiply. That is, it's going to turn out that when you eliminate two thirds greater than Q and one half, you're left with, you end up with this proposition. Two times two is greater than N, that is, greater than natural for the natural numbers, three times one. Now, I mean, so you're also going to have to somehow introduce these terms, two greater than three, right? They weren't included in the fundamental concepts, but I guess it's, well, a little bit easier to see how that's going to be possible. 
So, right, so eventually you're going to then reduce this to something that's stated in terms of the fundamental concepts and relations. It's going to be, you know, like 2 is the number such that 2 is the successor of 1. That's going to be the definition of 2. And greater than is going to be defined as basically like a natural number is greater than another one if you can use the successor relation to get from this one to the other. That is from the smaller one to the bigger one. As you see. Right, so, so eventually you're going to get this only in terms of those fundamental concepts, um, natural number and successor. And then those are the concepts that are in the axioms. So you take this, this is going to be much longer and more complicated than what you started out with. You take this long complicated proposition and you prove it from the axioms using the deductive system. Are there questions about that? So, um, and so one reason I'm going to such length to, to emphasize this is that the alpha is about this part, meaning that it's not part of the purpose of the alpha to prove that certain propositions are true. Well, at least not to prove that the propositions in the system are true. The alpha does try to prove certain things about constructional systems, <laughs> um, but uh, but it doesn't try to prove the propositions that are going to be in the theory we're talking about. On the contrary, it's going to be the business of empirical science to prove them. So in the case of empirical science, the axioms, so to speak, are going to be the contents of our experience. Right? Those are the things that we know are true. And the reduction is going to take all the concepts like rows and whatever and reduce them, not natural number, that's different, but all these empirical scientific concepts like rows and so forth are all going to get reduced to some con fundamental concepts that have to do with the contents of our experience. And then um, using the propositions that are true of our experience, Right, like yesterday, I saw red at this point in the visual field, and so on and so forth. It's going to be—it's going to also be possible to prove certain things are true, possible in principle, to prove certain things are true. But that's not what Carnap is trying to do in this book. He's focusing on this part, which is, again, trying to show that empirical concepts are meaningful. And to show that they're meaningful in this very precise way, that they can be reduced to fundamental concepts of experience. I think there's a question in the chat. Oh, I see there were two questions. There are two questions in the chat. I I think I already answered Annabelle's question. I'm not sure, but aren't relations propositions? Um, no, a relation. So, I mean, I know why someone would ask that. Um, a kind of traditional Aristotelian proposition has two places for concepts to go. And it asserts a certain relation between those concepts. Um, 
Um, and similarly, a relation has two places in which something can go. Objects, as what Carnap would call objects. What are objects? He says an object is something that you can say something true or false about. Anything. <laughs> you can say something true or false about. So, um, So, like, uh, you know, greater than and the natural numbers is a relation. And if I write it like this, it's called Polish notation. <laughs> if I write it like this, Carnap actually likes to write relation symbols between the two variables. That gives out if you have more than two places, so it's not really the meaning. Anyway, um, but if you write it like this, you can see um, it has two places for things, but the relation itself doesn't have anything filled into those places. Right? The relation is the greater than relation. What is greater than what? The relation doesn't tell you, right? The point of the relation is that you can plug whatever numbers you want into it, and then you'll get a true or a false proposition. This is also why, as we'll see next time, Carnap calls, um, or at least tightly connects concepts and relations to what he calls propositional functions, right? It's, it's, it's easy to see why you, this notation, why you would think of this as a kind of function. It's a function from pairs of numbers to propositions. So like if I give you the pair one, two, then I get greater than one, two, that is one is greater than two, false. If I give you the pair two, one, I get greater than 2, 1, that is 2 is greater than 1, true. Right, so the relation itself is not a proposition. It can be used to form a proposition in the same way that a concept can be used, that is a one-place relation, so to speak, can be used to form a proposition. Right, like if I say, Rose one, that is, the number one is a rose. Presumably that's false. Carnap is actually going to say that that's nonsense. <laughs> but we'll uh, see, I think, again, next time more of why he's going to say that's nonsense. It's not, um, it's not ridiculous to say that that's nonsense, right? You ask whether the number one is a rose or not. There seems to be something wrong with that question. It's not the kind of thing that could be a rose. <laughs> but so in any case, but the way we're thinking about it now, not having imposed any kind of restriction on what can go into these places, uh, that seems like a perfectly good proposition, but it's false. The number one is not a rose. Um, I think could say more about this. I'm not sure of the helpful. Oh, there's an, okay, Annabelle has another question. But aren't relations between concepts needed for the system to make new concepts? Can false relations between concepts be included in the constructional system? Um, that's a really good question. Um, but the answer, to answer it right at this moment, might throw things out of order in a way that would be confusing. Um, but I'll just say, like, I mean, put it this way. 
as long as we're just working on this constructional system and we don't know, so to speak, what it's going to be used for, um, the relations we use can't be false because we're defining the new concepts we introduce. Right? It's, it's a little bit of a weird kind of definition, but Carnap calls it a constructional definition, but it's kind of, it's, 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 it's arbitrary. Right? So if I decide to introduce the concept rows by like constructing it in terms of the natural numbers, so that it turns out that rows means what we usually mean by two thirds, then I didn't say anything false. I just decided to use the word rows to mean two thirds. <laughs> um, however, and I, I hope I'm going to still come back to this today. So, you know, um, it is true that. Like I said, the goal of this is to find all the concepts we need for empirical science in this structure. So, you know, that means that somehow it's going to have to match up with what empirical science thinks the relationship between different concepts is. Um, so there's like an internal question about whether we're using the right relations, to which the answer is yes, by definition. But then there's kind of an external question about whether we've used the right relations, like whether this can be actually now be used as the language of science or not. Um, and the answer to that might be no. Does that, I'm not sure if that helps with what you're Someone worried about. Someone has their now. hand up. What? Oh, Ryan has his hand up, I know, but I was still trying to answer. And also, someone asked before, uh, Griffin asked, does Carnap ever identify the foundational concepts? Yes, he will identify them in the, I think it's in the next reading. Anyway, soon, he will identify which, that is, he'll identify the foundational concepts he's chosen to use. Um, yes, Ryan. Professor, I guess I don't necessarily understand his uh, his use of like basic object because like I see it as like you know if I want to like have a concept have a concept like a tree like wouldn't that be just me empirically seeing a tree and wouldn't the like the the, uh, the reducibility of a tree into like you know molecules or something like that be their own realm of empirical science? So um, I don't necessarily see because um, he said the empirical part is the verification of the truth condition for the statement that was in that was that uh, he talked about being the main focus of previous systems, but how is this system not just due to empirical science, I guess? It is just is. due to, so, I mean, this is, again, I think we're getting uh, getting a lot of, a little out of order here, because this is a point I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I'm heading for, but, that, but it's, you know, it's, it's connected to what I was just saying to Annabelle's question. Um, in some sense, what we're doing here is prior to empirical science. Right, like building up. So, and he's not going to reduce tree to molecules, although he talks about a system form where you would do that. And we'll see in his later works, he, mo he goes more towards that system form. But he's going to reduce tree to, like I said, to my experiences. Right. So, um, so statements about trees will not be turned into statements about molecules. They'll be turned into statements about like visual and tactile experiences and stuff like that. Um, but in any case, um, so that, so in some sense what we're doing is in prior to empirical science because we're defining all the concepts that are going to be used in the empirical scientific statements. Um, however, in another sense, it's going to be a test of our results that um, our definitions match the results of empirical science. That is, we've, we've defined the concept tree correctly. That is that, you know, scientists who talk about trees 
or just ordinary people who talk about trees because and this is important like I think for the logical positivists there's a continuum between common sense ordinary life and science they don't really put a big division between those two so um, right that's why a lot of Carnap's examples will be about um, things that come up in ordinary everyday life so, um, like tree, for example, right? So, like, so you know, if we're if we're going to accept this um, constructional definition of tree, first of all, Carnap is going to have to be able to explain to us what, in our experience, his fundamental concepts correspond to. That's a problem, but anyway, and then. Um, we're going to have to be, once we understand that, we're going to have to be willing to accept the translation of the things that we ordinarily say about trees that's given in his system. If we don't accept it, then um, um, he hasn't provided a system that shows that the concepts that we actually use are meaningful. It shows that some other arbitrary concepts are meaningful. So that so that it's failed its task. I. It's. It's subtle and it's complicated, but it's it's actually one of the most important parts. So I I mean I like I said I hope I'll get back to it later. I'm, I'm doing a little bit. Uh, well, I don't know what to say. It's great that there's so many questions. Last quarter there were like no questions all quarter, and it was really depressing. <laughs> So, I mean, uh, but it, but it, but it does. On the other hand, it does sometimes uh, set me off track. So let me try to get back on track. Um, anyway, I, I mean, I guess Ryan, like, what it comes down to is what I'm saying is that question is is so good that it's one of the most important questions about this book. In what sense is is this a reaction to? The, exist, the already existing empirical science, and in what sense is it a kind of a priori preparation for empirical science? And it has to be in some sense one and in some sense the other for it to do what Carnap wants. Um, um, Okay, so I mean, so the thing about reducing the rational numbers to the natural numbers is something that, and the even more fundamental project of like reducing addition to the successor relation and stuff like that, um, is some, that's what Carnap found already done in Frege and Russell especially Russell. That is, from his point of view, it's especially Russell. Bertrand Russell, I guess. Um, uh, not everyone necessarily knows who that is, but anyway, there's this guy, Bertrand Russell, and one of the things he did, along with Whitehead, is to write this book um, called The Principia that uh, that tries to do exactly this kind of thing for mathematics. And basically the, the, um, the symbolism and the techniques of modern mathematical logic were invented for that purpose. They were invented by Frege and Russell for the purpose of doing something like what Carnap is talking about here for mathematics. Um, but Carnap is now going to the, the, the detailed project of how to do this is 
Carnap says, well, there's there's really two sources for it. One is various people like Mach and Avenarius who have um, who have worked on the reduction of science to the given. And but the other is the new mathematical logic. And you know, his project is going to succeed in a way that Mach and Avenarius, for example, couldn't succeed because he's using the apparatus of the new mathematical logic, which was developed to do this kind of reduction in mathematics, but he's now going to apply it to the whole of empirical science instead. Um, Wondering what I should focus on next. Behind. No, I guess I'm still gonna just gonna start with this. So, um, So there's um, so the the tool that he's using is modern mathematical logic as developed by Frege and Russell, and the problem he's using it to solve is well there's really kind of four different problems that are mixed together here. I don't mean they're confused with each other or something, but they're all on his mind. And in, and in his mind, they're all connected with each other. And uh, so one of them is um, a problem about logic and set theory, and or set theory. The technical problem about logic and set theory um, that uh, a certain kind of logic and or set theory um, turned out to be inconsistent. Um, this is what Carnap alludes to near the very beginning of the preface, the foundation crisis in mathematics. Um, In the last few decades, mathematicians have developed a new logic. They were forced to do this, but it wasn't really mathematicians proper who did this. Like I said, it was really philosophers, basically, Frege and Russell. But, I mean, the mathematicians were involved in some way. They were forced to do this from necessity, namely by the foundation crisis of mathematics, in which traditional logic had proved um, an utter failure. It not only proved incapable of dealing with these difficult problems, but something much worse happened. The worst fate that can befall a scientific theory, it led to contradictions. And I'll, next time I'll, I'll discuss exactly what the contradiction or what type of contradiction we're talking about. But, um, but uh, Carnap feels that especially Russell's well, Carnap and Russell feel that Russell's version of mathematical logic um, is the solution to this foundation crisis in mathematics. It shows how logic and set theory can be applied to mathematics in a way that doesn't lead to contradictions. Um, so that means, so I mean, that's a problem, again, that, that Carnap thinks that Russell has already solved. Um, so it's not a problem he's trying to solve himself, but it gives a certain status to mathematical logic, to Russell's version of it, which is called the theory of types. It, uh, it gives a certain status to it, 
it's been shown that this is the this is the way to free yourself from confusions that lead to irresolvable contradictions. So um, the second problem is like an ontological problem. Now, I mean. Ontology is a branch of metaphysics, and Carnap's solution to this problem is in the end to, get, to say that there is no such thing, there is no such discipline as ontology that has its own problems. <laughs> but he's going to replace ontological problems. The project is to replace ontological problems with um, problems that can be addressed using construction theory. So the ontological problem is a problem about the relationship between different object types, right? And as I'm sure, um, as as I'm sure you notice, the in the reading he he right away starts talking about all the object types that are found in different sciences and how they belong to different object spheres. That again is Husserlian terminology, although. I guess in a way it goes back to Parmenides, but <laughs> but it's certainly in terminology as he's using it. So um, it's found, or I guess you now to the Neoplatonist appropriation of Parmenides. Anyway, um, so they're found in different object spheres. Um, they seem to be not just different in kind, the way like roses and lilies are different from each other. They seem to exist in a different way or something like that. The things that you can say sensibly about one, you can't say sensibly about the other. And so the examples of these, and I guess um, to understand what's going on at this point in the book, you have to realize that, um, and this is also related to Ryan's question, he's all this interesting stuff he says about the relationship between psychological states and brains and cultural objects and psychological states and so on and so forth, he's not claiming that any of that is original. On the contrary, this whole part is just supposed to be to get some facts on the table, facts about the relationship between different object types, so that we can show how the constructional system is going to um, represent those facts. And it's going to represent those facts for, by, for example, succeeding in reducing psychological facts to facts about physical things. Now, um, It's natural to ask at this point, and Carnap address, you know, brings this up, right? It's natural to ask at this point, you say, wait, if I reduce psychological concepts to physical concepts, does that mean I'm saying there aren't really any psychological objects? All the things that I thought I was saying about psychological objects are really things I'm saying about physical objects. Or does it only show that there's some kind of mysterious correlation between psychological objects and physical objects that allows this translation to go through, that has to be explained? Why is it that every statement about psychological objects can be translated into a statement about brain states? And if one is true, the other is true and vice versa. What could explain that? So Carnap says those are both metaphysical statements. Construction theory is neutral between them. Construction theory just says you can translate these into these. And you ask, but wait, which one of them is real? He says that's not an empirically meaningful question. So we'll see more details about this later, but that's, you know, he's already making that point here early on. 
So, like I said, he's trying to, on the one hand, he's trying to explain a certain kind of ontological structure. And again, in its outlines, this actually goes back to antiquity, like the distinction between nature and soul and intellect and um, right, that comes out of Plato's laws. But anyway, you know, as, as different spheres, they also talk about spheres um, of being and how, you know, one is more... Uh, fundamental and the others emanate from that one and so on and so forth so uh, but it but it also it carries straight through well especially to Husserl is what he's thinking about but also a lot of other people like Diltai who he mentions in this period um, um, everyone is working with a certain ontological structure about the different kinds of things there could be construction theory is going to use mathematical logic to show that on the one hand there is such a structure, but on the other hand it's not an ontological structure. It's just a structure of constructional definitions. And, you know, how are constructional definitions going to explain this thing about different modes of being? Well, so, you know, it's basically because we're going to show that the new concepts that are constructed can't be, we can't say anything about them that we said about the old objects. They have their own set of predicates. So they're completely different. Nothing that's true of the old objects is true of the new objects or false of the new objects, right? But on the other hand, because of the reduction, those completely different things um, can, um, you can say everything you want to say about them by only talking about the fundamental things in principle. In principle, not in fact, right? I mean, this would be tremendously complicated. If you think about what you would have to say about what happens in your visual field and so on and so forth, that is equivalent to there's a tree there. Number one, it's going to be incredibly complicated. Right? Not all trees look the same. On the contrary, they look really different from each other. So it's going to be a, some very complicated rule. And it depends where you're standing and what you do. Right? Like it's, and moreover, it's, um, it's not finished until you get all the data you're ever going to get. Right? Because otherwise you might... You know, you might, they, there's still always a chance that it will turn out it was only a hologram or whatever, or that you were dreaming. <laughs> so it's so to actually check whether there's a tree there by going through all your. Also, you can't remember all your experiences. There's a lot of problems here, right? So to actually check, um, to actually do this part of the deductive system is something you could only do in principle. Um, but it's important to kind up that you can do it in principle. That's what he wants to show. That's enough to show that um, in some sense, there's only one domain of objects that all scientists are talking about in common. That is that science is unified. While it also explains why in another sense, every individual science is talking about its own separate domain of objects. Professor? Yes. Um, I, I have a question about something you mentioned about like, how is it possible if, can, if uh, how is it possible to like be able to predicate, let's say you have like two objects, object um, A is useful to object B, but how, how is it possible for you to predicate something different out of object A that wouldn't be an object B if it's, it's reducible? I, I, I'm going to not really uh, uh, understand that point. Well, it's like, you know, that's why I That's why I put this little subscript Q here to like 
So that, you know, I mean, um, for, like a trick. Yeah, no, it's not a trick. So let's, you know, so, so take this proposition, which is equivalent to this one, right? Well, I mean, they're both necessarily true. What do I mean by equivalent? It's a translation equivalent. We, we're willing to accept it as a translation of this one so that you can check whether this one is true by checking whether this one is true. But, you know, this relation here is defined in terms of the successor relation. That's how we introduced it. Right? So, you know, so 4 is greater than 3 in this sense of greater than really means that um, in this case, of course, 4 is the successor of 3. Right? So it means basically either 4 is the successor of 3 or there's some number such that 4 is the successor of n and n is the successor of 3 or what dot, 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 right? That's what the greater than relation among natural numbers is going to mean. That you can, as I said, that you can get from the smaller one to the big one by applying the successor relation enough times. You can't say that about one half. Rational numbers don't have successors, <laughs> right? What's the next rational number after one half? So this is not the same relation as this. So how, you know, and your, your question is, how is that consistent with this being reducible to this? Well, you know, we reduce all the concepts and relations that we have here to the ones that are in here. So we replace this relation with this relation. Is, am, am I getting at your question? Is that is what I'm saying helping at all? Yeah, I think I, I think I understand um, what part I'm missing. I think I might need to rewatch it later and then maybe <laughs> the reading a little bit more. Thank you. All right. So um, unfortunately, now I know that. From the notes I made to myself, the same thing happened last year. But I totally reorganized everything in a way that I thought it wouldn't happen. But it happened again. <laughs> the time for this lecture is ending, and there's still a lot of important stuff that I didn't say. I didn't even get to. There's two more things I want to add here besides logic and set theory and ontology. And the last one, number four, is about science, which is what the course is about. So that's the most important one. But uh, we're basically out of time. Um, I guess actually I have like one minute, so I will add those two things. So the, right, the third thing is something about language. Um, or thought, but for Carnap it's going to be language about you know. Um, how we can draw a distinction between meaningful and meaningless in advance before we start asserting something. We need to draw it in advance because um, if we don't already know that the concepts are meaningful, then um, uh, there's no point in trying to figure out if the proposition is true or false. Right, like I would say, all roses are bleg. <laughs> you know, until I tell you what bleg means, there's no point in trying to answer whether that sentence is true or false. Um, so, I mean, I, I guess it's already evident how the tools of mathematical logic are roughly, how they're going to be used for that. But then the fourth one is, I mean, it's really an epistemological question. Or at least it's related to traditionally what would be thought of as an epistemological question. And the question is something like, um, how do 
how does science have the right to talk about objects with which we have no direct acquaintance? And what are the limits of that? How can we draw a principled limit there? Right, so no one has ever seen an electron. No one has ever seen a monad. Why, how, why does, or does, can you explain why science has a right to talk about electrons but not monads? All right, that's all that I have time for today. And um, um, so I will see you next time. Oh, and I see Wilson had a question, but is this, yeah, Wilson, what was your question? Yeah, I just have a quick question. Um, I just saw the email in regards to delayed in-person instruction. Um, would we be like following that as well? I didn't see just it <laughs> yet. What did uh, the email say? <laughs> um, yeah, it's just that it's push, uh, in-person instruction was delayed until 31st of January when the booster requirement, like deadline, ends, I guess. Okay, well, I mean, if first of all, if that's what they said, we'll definitely follow it. Um, second of all, it sounds like a good idea, so it's probably we should follow it. <laughs> okay. Right. Um, thanks for pointing that out. But next okay. week was going to be remote anyway, so it's not an imminent issue. Okay. All right. I'll see everyone next week. Bye. Thank you, Professor. Thank you.